Welcome to this lecture on genotype to phenotype. We've been exploring this idea that genetic information inside of a cell flows from genes to proteins to traits. We've been focused here on how proteins can determine the traits of an organism. Today we're going to zoom out a little bit and look at how genes connect to proteins, connect to traits. In other words, how information goes from genotype to phenotype. You'll be wanting to follow along in your workbook. This is page 29. Um, and one thing that I'd like you to add is a box on the side, a question box. And so as you uh, work through this, uh, list two to three questions that popped into your mind while you're completing the notes. We'll be continuing to work with these cellular models where we've been drawing different proteins or enzymes inside of the cell, or maybe they've been receptor proteins on the outside of the cell, with the idea that the type of proteins that you have in your cells determines traits. And so, in this case, this was for the rock pocket mouse. If a mouse has non-functional enzymes, the tan molecule stays tan. If it has any functional enzyme, well then the tan molecule can be converted into a black molecule we're going to look now at what's happening here in the nucleus. We're going to be adding genes to the model. In understanding genes, we're going to have to understand the structure of DNA a little bit. First of all, chromosomes. When DNA gets coiled and, and wound up into these large molecules that can be found inside of the nucleus of a cell, we call those chromosomes. Genes are simply sections of DNA that have instructions for making a protein. Chromosomes have thousands of genes. In the background, you can see some of the identified genes on this single chromosome. Circled here in red is one particular gene, the hemoglobin protein gene. This gene contains instructions for making one of the hemoglobin proteins. Most cells have multiple chromosomes. Assuming here on the nucleus of a human cell, we can see 23 pairs of chromosomes. These are chromosome images that have been taken with a microscope and with the aid of a computer, a technician has lined these chromosomes up into pairs, matching chromosomes. Matching chromosomes are called homologous chromosomes. For each pair of homologous chromosomes, an individual got one from their mother and one from their father. This means that you get two versions of each gene, one from your mother and one from your father. Well, you get a copy of every single gene from both your mother and your father, the version might be different. We call these different versions of genes alleles. The different alleles are for the same gene, but the code might be slightly different. It's kind of like having two different recipes for snickerdoodle cookies. Both recipes are for snickerdoodles, but one version calls for white flour, and the other version calls for whole wheat flour. In this example, we're looking again at the gene for hemoglobin B, the protein that allows red blood cells to transport oxygen. Everybody has two copies of the hemoglobin B gene, one from their mother, one from their father but the alleles might be different. They might have a different version from the mother than from their father. So each homologous chromosome in a pair will be matching because each one has the same genes, but they're not identical because the alleles can be different. Let's see how what we've learned applies to our bioflowers. In bioflowers, there's a pigment enzyme that converts blue pigment to red pigment. That pigment enzyme can be functional or non-functional. So you can probably already think to yourself how the types of proteins that are inside of the bioflower cell will determine whether that flower is blue or red. We're also going to be taking a look at genes today and exploring what it means for a flower to have a blue allele or a red allele for the flower color gene. I know that you've been taking notes on page 29. You're also now going to want to flip the page and make some drawings as notes on page 30.
This first flower type has two functional alleles for the pigment enzyme. This means that the cell is going to produce functional pigment enzyme. Go ahead and add that on your page 30. You can color in the alleles to show that they're functional. And then for each allele, draw at least one protein. These are the functional ones, the functional pigment enzymes. And then check this out. We've got blue pigment inside the cell. And that blue pigment can be changed by the pigment enzymes into red pigment. You can show that on your page with arrows. Now we'll go ahead and answer some of these other questions here. Is there any functional pigment enzyme in the cell? Yes, there is. Both alleles had instructions to make functional pigment enzyme. So we drew that out in the cell. That allowed the blue pigment to be converted to red pigment. This flower is going to be red. Now for these other flower types, oh that's funny, flower type 2, flower type 3. For these other flower types, I'm not going to come back here and draw what's in the cell for you. You'll have to do this yourself. I know for one thing that in this next cell, we're going to have one functional allele. And the other one will be for a non-functional pigment enzyme. But you need to draw the rest of what's in here. You can follow along in the slides that I'll present next. Okay, in flower type 2, because we have an allele that codes for functional enzyme, we got some of that functional enzyme in here, but the other allele codes for non-functional enzyme. Proteins get made from both alleles, and so make sure that you draw at least one functional enzyme, one non-functional enzyme, and so what happens with the pigment? Well, starting with blue pigments, that blue pigment can be changed by the functional enzyme into red pigment. I'll show that one more time. I know my animations don't line up perfectly. Blue pigment is changed by the functional enzyme in red pigment. Okay, go ahead and show that with arrows on your page. In bioflower 3, both alleles code for non-functional enzymes. And so what do we have out in, these, in the cell? We have only non-functional enzymes. And so that's going to take the blue pigment and, well, actually it cannot be changed to red pigment. So this flower type will stay blue. This chart summarizes what you just drew in your cells. And so for the homologous pair of chromosomes in the first flower type, we saw that one of the pairs had a functional allele. One of the pairs, the other pair also had a functional allele. Uh, and so this led to a red flower. In the case of the homologous pair in type 2 flower having a functional allele and a non-functional allele, that also led to a red flower. It was only when the, both of the homologous chromosomes had non-functional alleles that led to the blue flower. Since the functional allele coded for a red flower, we can actually call that allele, that version of the gene, uh, the red version of the gene. And how many red alleles are needed to produce a red flower? Well, it works when there are two red alleles. It also works when there are just one red allele. So only one red allele is needed to produce a red flower. How many blue alleles are needed to produce a blue flower? Well, remember the blue allele codes for a non-functional enzyme and all the enzyme needs to be non-functional. If there's even just one copy of the functional enzyme, it'll turn the flower red. And so you need two copies. They both need to be the blue allele for that flower to be blue. This is where this idea of dominant and recessive alleles come from. Because only one red allele is needed, that's the dominant allele.
for the flower to be blue, there needs to be no red alleles. It takes two blue alleles. That's the recessive allele. Now one thing I want to make clear is that dominant and recessive is not the same as more common and less common. Blue bioflowers might be more common because they survive better in the wild, even though it's the recessive trait. Now scientists have shortcuts when it comes to representing alleles. Even red allele and blue allele are shortcuts. Instead of saying the uh, allele that codes for the functional pigment enzyme or the allele that codes for the non-functional pigment enzyme, we could just say red or blue, but actually let's take it a step further. Capital letters represent the dominant allele and lowercase letters represent the recessive allele. When we represent alleles, we use the same letter. In this case, R is the letter that represents the dominant trait. So looking back at the summary chart, we can make some changes for simplification. In this case, we have big R, big R leads to a red flower. Big R, little r also leads to a red flower. It has at least one of the dominant alleles. Little r, little r leads to a blue flower. So the combination of alleles determines the observed characteristics of an organism, and scientists have some specific names for this. Phenotype refers to the observed or measurable trait of an organism as it relates to a gene. Genotype is the underlying alleles that an organism has for the trait. So for our example of flower color, the trait is flower color. The phenotype for flower color is either red or blue. The genotype is big R, big R. That's one type. Big R, little r. That's another type. Little r, little r is the third type. So we can replace allele combination with genotype, and we can replace observed characteristics with phenotype. And finally, homozygous refers to a condition where the two alleles are the same. So big R, big R, and little r, little r are homozygous genotypes. Heterozygous is when the alleles are different, big R, little r, or little r, big r. You'll notice that red flowers can either be homozygous dominant, big R, big r, or heterozygous. Blue flowers are always homozygous recessive, little r, little r. So you can come back to page 33 here. Your flower types are going to be filled out already. But over here with genotype, in this first situation, the alleles are the same. This is homozygous. This is homozygous dominant. Here we have two different alleles. That's heterozygous. And here we have two alleles that are the same again. That's homozygous. In this case, homozygous recessive. 